this series of studies on the philosophy of history. And as we have carried it under the title of the cycle of the phoenix, we should reiterate that this cycle of 600 years originating in antiquity seems to supply an admirable framework for a study of the great periods in the historical descent of man. Last week we analyzed the period beginning with the 12th century and extending through the Reformation, the Renaissance, and the dawn of the modern world, particularly the great era of exploration. We pointed out also that although history seems to build uh, to very critical cycles, actually history is a flowing of cause and effect. And each crisis that arises in the development of the historical perspective is the natural outcome of antecedent causes. Therefore, we realize that when we choose an arbitrary date, we are not choosing a beginning, but rather are choosing a point of crisis where various factors long established have been welded together into a kind of pattern that suddenly emerges and profoundly affects the destiny of human beings. Our next cycle of the Phoenix, therefore, passes from the year 1200 for approximately 600 year interval and brings us to approximately the year 1800. This year ushered in the 19th century. And this century is rather close to us. And perhaps we consider ourselves well informed as to the occurrences which have marked it. At the same time, in our thinking, there are points that well may have been overlooked. We like to think of this period, beginning about the year 1800, as the era of liberation. Here we find a tremendous emphasis upon the emergence of man, of the increasing influence of the human being as an equation in the motions of society. There is a gradual shift from minority rulership to the rulership by masses, by groups. Also a corresponding decrease in the individualization of the person, a decrease which has reached rather startling proportions in this, the middle of our 20th century. Gradually, the emphasis in history also changed. The historian became a new kind of person. And at approximately the period we note, about the year 1800, we observe a subtle modification occurring in man's relation to historical perspective. This uh, modification had to do with the establishment of ancient history upon a scientific basis. As you probably realize, up to about this time, man's knowledge of history outside of contemporary affairs was extremely sketchy. Uh, the 18th century historian writing, for example, about Egypt was without benefit of the Rosetta Stone. He was required, therefore, to depend upon the fables of the Greeks and, to a degree, the fabulous histories of the Romans for any knowledge that he might possess of Egypt. Yet very near the time we mention, the Rosetta Stone was discovered, and with it, the modern Egyptologist opened 5,000 years of classical Egyptian history. Now this opening had more value than might seem at first. The decoding of the glyphs by Champollion was a fascinating, dramatic episode. Yet it also had a long-range effect upon our thinking. Out of the past, for example, emerged a great culture a culture with a strange, long history of its own. A culture which in many episodes paralleled our own. A culture which, like an ancestor, which had lived before us, 
experienced most of the things which we experience, passed through numerous trials and tribulations, set in motion causes which could only produce inevitable results. Thus, Egypt emerged as a great object lesson in terms of history, in terms of culture, religion, philosophy. And we suddenly crossed this long interval of the unknown and found the ancient Egyptian to be a human being like ourselves and not merely a shadow cast by a few fragments of Greek and Roman literature. The same thing occurred in the development of our knowledge of Near Eastern archaeology. About the year 1800, uh, the, church uh, the church historian, the religious uh, thinker in the world of history, suddenly shifted his perspective. He no longer depended upon Josephus and Eusebius. He no longer attempted to write history by rewriting previous history. He became aware of archaeology. He became aware of the possibility of excavating within the regions of his interests bringing to light lost records, lost objects, lost artifacts, by which, again, he, can, he was able to humanize the antiquity with which he was concerned. We may therefore note a broad development of archaeological research with its effect upon history and the shifting of it from rumor and tradition to revealed and established fact. This was important because it helped the 19th century man to orient himself. He suddenly realized that he did not stand at a summit of an exclusive and isolated culture. He realized that behind him was wave after wave of integrated orderly historical motion. That many nations had risen and fallen before his time and that in a way he was heir to them all. This approach to history solved many mysteries and riddles and it caused us to begin to realize that arts and sciences did not spring into existence uh, full grown like Minerva from the head of Zeus, but had gradually and painfully evolved over long periods of time. This emphasis began to establish the historical importance of the law of evolution. It also began to strengthen in man's thinking the importance of tracing his own origin. He began to conceive no longer 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years of human existence, but uh, pressed back the boundaries of man's life, coming to figures exceeding million or 10 million years. He began to have more and more proof of things which had previously seemed strange, unbelievable, and mysterious. All of this certainly affected our way of life. In these researches also, a more critical attitude was turned toward the achievements of the past. And in this critical attitude, man came upon a number of interesting and important facts still useful to him. He began to take a systematic study, uh, make a systematic study, for example, of Roman law, and discovered that the Romans, in many respects, were better legislators the 19th century English and American judges and lawyers. He began to recognize the importance of man's experiment with the mystery of government. He observed now 5,000 years of administrative policies. He could see why some succeeded and others failed. He could observe the common traps into which most had fallen. He was able to contemplate the extreme measures and emergency processes which men of the past had set up and which brought a variety of consequences, some good and some bad. Thus, a new perspective was given, not only in this field but to medicine, uh, to science in general, to mathematics, to art, music, literature. There was just a great opening, and the foundations that had been laid in the 17th and 18th centuries for the liberalizing of the human mind began to prove valuable. Men began to appreciate, as they had not before, the works of the certain uh, link thinkers, particularly men of the caliber of Bacon and Descartes. Uh, these recognitions led also to a better understanding of the world 
that had suddenly emerged into the thinking of men such as Voltaire, Rousseau, Thomas Paine, and our own American Benjamin Franklin. Thus, by degrees, provincialism broke down. Also, the isolationism which man had placed around his then uh, existing culture. Uh, men had thought of the 19th century and of the 18th and the 17th as islands upon the surface of barbarism, that they were surrounded by a sea of ignorance. Suddenly, men began to realize that they lived not on islands, but on great continents, intellectual continents, and that these continents sustained a variety of interesting and important uh, knowledge and understanding. All these things led the way to what we might term the opening of the modern world as we know it, a world in which the individual was able to take new ideas without shock or stress to his personality, in which he no longer thought merely of his own culture but of world culture, and also in which he had the courage to begin to fit man into a place in the plan rather than to assume that the plan was devised solely for the benefit of man. To a degree, this may have seemed a bit humiliating uh, to the human being who had regarded himself as unique. But with the coming of the 19th century, the unique man disappeared. And in his place arose a pattern of process, of procedure, of evolution, of foldment, of gradual integration, and of the converging of innumerable streams of light to make possible the kind of world which we live in today. With it came some broadening appreciation also of the valuable contributions of distant areas, such as Asia, the Near East, North Africa, etc. Now, this 19th century also brought with it, as one might suspect, the kind of extreme attitude with which change is nearly always marked. There is a certain fanaticism about change. Things happen rapidly before man is able to digest them. The leader may exceed his own reasonable boundaries. He may try to force his conclusions beyond their facts. A good example of that can also be found in the 20th century, in which the rise, for example, of psychological thinking has caused a kind of unbalance in our philosophical life. Psychology became a cure-all, a solution to everything a tremendous discovery which men did not evaluate correctly. They simply accepted or rejected empirically. And as a result, this situation rather got out of hand. In the 19th century, uh, progress was out of hand. The individual had not yet matured and mellowed his perspective. All these new and wonderful things that came to his attention confused him, filled him with a certain optimism, but did not give him uh, the instruments of discrimination and discernment. These had to come gradually as a result of experiencing the unhappy consequences of his own position. About this time also, another stream of problem was beginning to develop. Uh, this had developed from the pressures of the Reformation. Uh, the Reformation uh, was the exchange of one orthodoxy for another. It was man's intellectual liberation from the hierarchy of the Roman Church to fall under a kind of bondage or slavery to a strange kind of rebellious stubbornness. The Puritan was a man of devout mind and of good intention, we do not doubt, but he was extremely narrow in his thinking. His attitude was so completely, literally bound up with the jots and tittles of the scripture, and dominated also by a kind of antagonism against anyone that differed from himself. Uh, this kind of pressure had a very depressing effect upon the spiritual life of the individual. The Reformation, uh, bringing as it did a strong emphasis upon Protestantism, led inevitably uh, to a rebellion within the human being. And this rebellion manifested itself in the early 19th century as the rise of Protestant mysticism. Protestant mysticism being man's escape again, this time from a literal acceptance of doctrine. 
This escape was pressed to a further degree by the rising structure of man's technical knowledge. Uh, archaeology was discovering facts. These facts had to be fitted into theological concepts which had not been prepared uh, to accept them. The world changed its pattern. Uh, the opening chapters of Genesis became less digestible in a literal form. Men loved their religious writings, however, they venerated them and wished to preserve them. The only answer seemed to be, to be to enlarge their interpretation. So we find groups arising such as the New England Transcendentalists under the leadership of such men as Thoreau and Emerson. These individuals were fighting for the, re for the restoration of the beauty of a mystical religion, a mystical philosophy of life a philosophy which was strong in idealistic overtones and yet was broad and deep enough to accept the discoveries of an ever increasingly strong scientific body. Thus we have at this time in America the rise of our first important school of letters. Uh, we find scholarships stretching out uh, far into the hinterland for inspiration. Examination of Emerson's library is now partly possible because the old uh, Massachusetts library which he used fortunately kept records of the books which were loaned to various persons. And the books selected by Emerson have now become uh, a, an important list. Uh, these books included not only uh, the best European writers, uh, but the best translations of the Greek scholars, especially those translations made by Thomas Taylor, outstanding works such as Stanley's History of Philosophy, and the early available issues of Oriental classics, particularly the first English edition of the Bhagavad Gita. These books were all used by Emerson, and as a result, we begin to see why he came to be regarded as a geographical misfit, and why many people felt that he should have been born in a classical cultural group rather than in a rather square-toed puritanical New England. But this break uh, presented itself in a num number of other forms meaning in the early years of the 19th century that we had quite a revival of religious interests, uh, many of them centering in the eastern part of the United States, but spreading out. The New England Transcendentalists undoubtedly contributed uh, to many of the uh, religious, liberal religious organizations that we know today. They made possible the rise of what we term modern, popular, metaphysical thinking. They also contributed uh, as much as they could to a powerful idealism, although this has become generally obscured outside of the religious field. We also find rising at this time movements that were to uh, pro profoundly affect our religious thinking, such as spiritualism, which also arose in New England, Christian science, and of course Mormonism, which came into existence at no great distance from the other groups. All these movements represented a kind of revolt partly inspired by the impossibility of making uh, the older theological interpretations uh, agree with the rising body of scientific knowledge. A man in t uh, determined to preserve his religious conviction found it necessary to grow and to enlarge his understanding of the spiritual values which were important to him. There was at this time also a strong rise of interest in St. Paul, and his uh, mystical concept of Christianity uh, became really the central focus of the transcendentalist movements arising in the United States. These were all movements that had to do with the concept of liberation, but perhaps in another department this activity is more obvious and uh, better recorded historically. Around the year 1800, we find the beginning of what we term the era of revolutions. Revolutions, in this case, uh, gather around this focal year. Some uh, were somewhat earlier, others were to follow shortly after. But in the period between around 1750 and 1850, we had uh, most of the basic revolutionary movements working themselves out on the political level. We know, for example, that uh, the first important pronouncements of Karl Marx uh, came into existence about 1840. 
that these had exercised at their time only a limited influence, but gradually intensified to form a positive basis for what was then known as socialism. Socialism being a movement of liberation on the political level. Around this same time, uh, we see the results of the French Revolution, the reign of terror, of terror, and the rise of the Napoleonic Empire. We have, therefore, at this time, a vast war pattern which almost parallels the 12th century conquest of Genghis Khan. Also at this time, we find the breaking away of, of colonial America, particularly from Spain. And we see the rise of a number of heroes and heroic personalities in the Latin area. Between 1800 and around 1840 or 50, thus we find uh, coming some of the uh, more important names <laughs> that we associate with the rise of democracy in the West. In Mexico, Miguel Hidalgo, the liberator. Uh, one of the most powerful men of his time, although his own achievements were not marked with any great success, he, he formed a breach or made a breach in a wall through which others were to pass later. At this time also we find Simon Bolivar, the liberator of Latin America in general, at least one of the most venerated names in the area, uh, making his famous oath of Rome, that he was going to liberate his people from ignorance, superstition, and fear. He accomplished a great deal, was neglected, ignored, and very largely misused by those he had served so well, and it is said that he ended his career penniless, dying in a bed given to him by a friend in a bar of nightshirt. The uh, friend, uh, the um, bed, and Bolivar had the nightshirt, not the friend. Anyway, the, uh, <coughs> the situation goes on. We find Benito Juarez appearing about this period and gradually developing the campaign which was to change again a large part of the history of the Latin American area. Thus, all through this early time, we see men struggling for liberation. We find also in this struggle the gradual liberating of slaves. We observe laws passed in one country after another by means of which the freedom of the human being became more and more a concern of the public mind. In the earlier part of this period we find the rise of the little Republic of Liberia, which was the beginning of Negro emancipation from the United States. And the cycle terminates, of course, with the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Other nations, however, had also passed into this cycle of liberation. And one by one, uh, these countries uh, dissolved the laws by which slavery was possible and also by which imprisonment for debt was possible. These changes affected the political life of the world. They affected the estates of persons and there were other important uh, moves also made. Up to about the year 1800 and even a little later than that, education was very, under, very largely under the influence of religion. Up to the time we mention, nearly all the chairs of the doctorate of philosophy in our great schools were held by doctors of divinity, <laughs> producing what has been called the cycle of the Scottish metaphysicians. Uh, the schools were very largely dominated by uh, religious thinking on the level of philosophy and psychology. We see this beginning to break down and find uh, the rise of the doctor of philosophy in his own right without dependence upon theology or religion. Uh, this was almost inevitable in view of the situation that was gradually building up to the final discoveries and pronouncements of the Darwinian theory. Thus, the world was in transition. Intellectually, it was moving very rapidly. Uh, physically, it had not yet changed to any appreciable degree. But uh, the causes of change were beginning to become evident everywhere. Even as early as the year 1800, or shortly thereafter, we also observe another interesting uh, economic situation, which called for a lot of a reorganization of human policy. Although we had not yet entered into an industrial era, what we termed business was beginning to loom large on the horizon. 
business at that time was conducted in small offices by uh, underpaid clerks who spent most of their time writing letters in beautiful Spencerian hands for their comparatively illiterate proprietors. It was a uh, not a particularly encouraging period. Good wages at that time in England were 12 pounds a year for a good clerk. And uh, perhaps some of these uh, abuses are shown in Dickens' writings, especially his Christmas Carol. Uh, the um, situation, however, was that merchants were reaching out in all directions. Uh, the sea had become a more or less open area. Trade with various countries became more and more imperative uh, to take care of the rising levels of life at home. Uh, it was becoming necessary to export goods and it was also becoming increasingly important to import raw materials. As early, therefore, as 1790, we begin to see uh, strong agitations uh, involving the establishment of powerful trading units. Some of these trading units had already been rather effective, but heavy strain was put upon them. We had groups such as the Hudson's Bay Company, the East India Company, uh, the China Company, and other groups working to create markets for European goods in Asia and also seeking concessions in the East by means of which they would be able to secure further materials with which to advance the industrial state of labor in their respective countries. This ran against considerable opposition as might be expected and early in the century this opposition locked itself around the history of China which therefore becomes intriguing to us. China at that time was under the comparatively new Manchu dynasty. The Manchurians had more or less taken over, had established themselves strongly in Peking, and had also become strongly Chinese. Now in those days, China's policy was a very simple one in international relationships. It was extremely simple inasmuch as China recognized only the Chinese and slaves or servants. The non-Chinese world consisted of barbarians not worthy of any consideration whatsoever and not upon a psychological level which justified any tre treaties with them or any efforts to attain um, economic parity. Uh, time after time, delegates were sent with full documentation and with uh, very bulging portfolios uh, to China to try to negotiate treaties. The Chinese consistently regarded these diplomats as merely merchants, refused to meet them, sent only their servants to consult with them, and paid no attention whatever to their demands. China's exclusiveness led to considerable controversy. And in the course of this controversy, uh, bad feeling passed from bad to worse and finally resulted in a series of minor wars and outbreaks, the purpose being very largely to establish treaties with China. China was for some reason a very central factor in these negotiations. Gradually these treaties began to take form and ultimately uh, Europe and America behind treaties moved into Asia. This uh, uh, was important. The entry of the English into China, the entry later of the French, then the Dutch, then the United States, and several other countries meant not only an exchange of merchandise, but an exchange of ideas. This is notable uh, uh, in passing in its effect upon the ceramic industry of England. For about this time, or shortly thereafter, a large part of English dinnerware was ornamented with Chinese paintings, carefully copied from things like the famous Chinese blue plate design and other similar uh, patterns. The pattern also moved into France, which had a practical epidemic of neo-Chinese uh, artistry. Uh, going so far as to affect the costumes of the court and of the uh, and the artistry of the various uh, schools of design, uh, such as fabrics, upholstery, and uh, furniture, even architecture. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, we find the 
peculiar situation such as the Chinese Chippendale in which the furniture makers began to copy Chinese uh, furniture. All of this carried with it still further overtones. Uh, we could not deal with these people, we could not import the beautiful things which they made, and we could not reject them as customers without finally becoming a little more aware of them as persons. Let us say that at the turn of the century, around the year 1800, the European population of China was about 90% missionaries. These missionaries were having a more or less troublesome time of it, and uh, about the year 1800, it was estimated they had managed to make about 150,000 Ch Christian converts in China out of a population of 300 or 350 million. They were not getting along too well. In fact, at that time, the death rate was overtaking them. Uh, at uh, Behind these missionaries came a few merchants. The missionaries, because of tradition, Christian missionaries had been visiting China since the second century. Because of tradition, these missionaries were reasonably well treated, and with the exception of an occasional interlude, uh, were left much in peace. But to bring anything else in was extremely difficult, and it was some years before its string of treaty ports were finally established. The Chinese had their side to this also, however, because one of the great difficulties in the early half of the uh, 19th century was the introduction of opium into China from Europe. The Chinese resented this very strongly and quite rightfully, and the opium wars and things of that nature rather disfigured Europe's place in Chinese uh, history. Gradually, however, through treaties, this situation was largely remedied, but never entirely so. This meant another extending of boundaries and of motions away from the old patterns of things, the uh, establishment of more intimate contact with the older world, an older culture, and through the Honorable East India Company, the same thing was happening largely in India. Thus, we have a new picture here. Uh, from the ancient classical times and the gradual infiltration of uh, culture from Asia into Europe, a cultural infiltration which extended from about the 10th century BC down well into the medieval period in European history, we suddenly had a reverse. Now we had Europe and America uh, infiltrating into Asia, carrying into Asia manufactured goods, carrying into the Far East the products of Western ingenuity, and perhaps most of all the advantages of Western methodology and Western science. This stream continued to increase until it really became quite common. By the middle of the century also, we see the opening of Japan. The opening of Japan is a sufficiently interesting episode for us to give as little attention to it. For some time, the United States and other powers have been attempting to negotiate an important treaty with the Mikado of Japan. All efforts have failed because the Mikado could not be reached. The Mikado at that time was residing quietly in Kyoto, which was the old cultural center of Japan, and the government was in the hands of the great Tokugawa shogunate. Now, the Tokugawa shoguns were the military dictators of Japan and uh, belonged to a descent of families which had held this position uh, for a very long time, perhaps even as early as the 12th century under Yoritomo. Uh, this dictatorship left the Mikado as spiritual head of the empire, but all material and practical concerns were in the hands of these dictator princes, these uh, great daimyos, that uh, formed a sort of military political council under the Shogun. When Giri finally was able to reach Japan, he was only able to present his credentials to the Shogun. He never did reach the Mikado, although for some time it was believed that he had. Gradually, however, uh, the effect of the entry of Kiri's fleet and uh, the psychological contact, consequence of this contact with the West began to uh, bear fruit. Uh, the only previous contact of importance had been that of St. Francis Xavier, who had created a missionary colony in the province of Satsuma.
<coughs> and the moment it became obvious that the West and East must meet, that Japan prepared for the blow. Uh, how Japan suddenly qualified for, for entrance into the Western family of nations is not entirely known to us, because so much of their history at this time remains as yet untranslated into English. But one thing is certain, that Japan has woke to the realization that it must join the other powers as a united nation, that it must have a sovereignty vested in a person or in some recognized and generally revered leader. Up to that time, Japan had been in a state of feudalism, very similar to that of Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries. This could not be possible if it was to enter into uh, contact with more highly organized political entities. After due deliberation and consideration, therefore, the last of the Tokugawa shoguns, the military dictator, presented his credentials to the emperor and resigned, returning all of his powers to the crown. This was done voluntarily, which is an unusual episode in anybody's history, that a family that had been in power uh, probably for 600 years, or a descent of families, should voluntarily relinquish all of that power for the good of the nation. This the shogun did, however and the Mikado emerged as both spiritual and temporal leader of Japan. From that time on, the history of Japan shows the increasing influence of Western uh, culture, uh, Western industrialism, Western progress, as we like to call it. And by the end of the 19th century, Japan was a recognized world power. This is another example of the impact which brought about a marked change in the psychology of international relationships. One other point might be made, however, to show that the Japanese dies hard. I remember that when I was in Japan about the time of the great earthquake in Tokyo, uh, the first taxi cabs had been introduced. A group of them had been uh, taken off of a ship and were standing on the docks waiting to be uh, put into use. The Japanese rickshaw men, forming a very quiet but po powerful union of their own, went quietly down to the dock and dumped them all into the ocean <laughs> because of the inevitable disastrous result of such conveyances in the uh, economy of Japan. Now, however, we are informed that the rickshaw is almost extinct and is only to be found uh, as an occasional novelty for the benefit of tourists, like some of the old uh, horse-drawn carriages that you can still see uh, parked at the south end of Central Park in New York waiting for a stray customer. Uh, Japan uh, did not move too quickly, but a gradual process of modernization was noted throughout its entire uh, structure. Now we go to one of the more important phases of this, which is all moving in one direction, whether we realize it or not. And we have to study a little bit uh, the application of history to the thinking of the early 19th century, as this bears upon uh, the present state of man. Uh, the United States, France, had established a democratic government. The, the government of the United States maintained its democracy, uh, or its republican form of democracy, without any great mishap, although it had a number of very close shades. On the other hand, the French did not do so well. Uh, they were not apparently of one mind in the matter of democracy. They had achieved their freedom against uh, the autocracy of the Bourbon uh, at a tremendous cost and with an extraordinary fanaticism that was bound to leave a great many scars. Thus France uh, fell out of um, uh, monarchy into democracy and promptly fell out of democracy into imperialism. Uh, with the rise of the Napoleonic era. From that time on, for a long while, the democracy as a functioning entity in France had uh, numerous uh, setbacks. Uh, the, uh, the idea did not sit as well in Europe as it did in America. The psychological conditioning was entirely different, and there was evidently too much bad history in the background to permit the experiment to proceed in a reasonable way. But uh, with this change in the political state of two important nations, 
and with the coming of a new attitude toward knowledge, we begin to see uh, a development of sciences, a development of exact thinking, with a corresponding decline in what might be termed essential culture. Uh, the 19th century shows a very serious decadence in culture and a tremendous rise in man's intellectual productivity. Uh, the 19th century is remembered to us very largely for the, the rather cramped and stuffy uh, mid-Victorianism in which probably nearly every important art and creative expression uh, went under eclipse. Uh, it was a bad period in painting, a very poor period in uh, architecture, a miserable period in stylization, and it produced uh, very little in the creative fields of art except in Europe where there was a tremendous renaissance of music. But uh, with the exception of music, uh, nearly all forms of art uh, suffered seriously. This is interesting in comparison to our present situation where we are again diving into an, in, an era of intensive scientific uh, research and progress. Here again, practically the only art that is surviving and is actually flourishing is music. Nearly all other arts are being heavily penalized. It is probable that music has uh, survived uh, this period and also survived the 19th century period because of its non-intellectual Act, uh, reaction upon the individual. Uh, music does not interfere with the Darwinian theory or the Mendelian law. Uh, music does not get locked into, into a conflict over the Newtonian hypothesis. Uh, music is not, able, is not involved in the present problem of uh, interspace travel. The music, because of its almost total emotional impact upon the listener, is something which is compatible with nearly every other interest or activity of the human mind and forms a very important escape mechanism under periods of great intellectual stress. I think this is also evident in the fact that the technical composer, who is a great musicologist in his own right, is not frequently found in a mechanistic group. It is still to be found more in the European group, particularly the Slavic. But where um, we have a strong emotional frustration, music seemingly occupies a prominent position. Uh, the 20th century science has locked itself with idealism in a more or less uh, continuing struggle. 19th century scientific footings uh, were assailed by the then existing theological systems pretty strongly. There was quite a religious science battle going on at that time. Unfortunately, uh, the armament was rather unequal. Science was coming forward with facts that were difficult to disprove, and theology was unable to cope with these facts. It was one of the uh, examples of a situation about which we should be most thoughtful. Namely, we do religion an ill turn when we so interpret it that it can come into conflict with progress. One of the things that's important in religion, as the Indian philosophers found out long ago, was that the religious conviction must be kind of open toward the future so that new discoveries will not discredit religious convictions but rather will only help to sustain them and float them forward. A good example of this was the impact of Westernism upon Japan and its dominant faith, which is Buddhism. Uh, as far as we can learn from historical records, uh, the modernizing of Japan did not cause a moment's ruffle in the development of the Buddhistic faith in that country. There was never a time in which a Buddhist priest or anyone of that kind thundered against progress. There was never a time when modern scientific methodology uh, or modern scientific concepts came into a head-on collision with a Buddhist doctrine. The reason being that Buddhism was very astute in not establishing any boundaries upon the human consciousness.
anything that man discovered, anything that he realized, anything that he was able to demonstrate in a laboratory was as far as the Orient was concerned, good Buddhism. Because there was nothing in the doctrine uh, by means of which a heretic on the scientific level could be conceived possible. There was therefore comparative freedom from this rather unhappy situation. The year of liberation also began uh, with a series of rather simple movements uh, beginning in the lives of people. One thing that everyone has always wanted to be liberated from was taxation. And of course we can begin to appreciate today just exactly uh, what that would mean. In fact, I saw a document not long ago uh, being advanced by someone, uh, hoping that it would catch the public opinion, stating that, the, uh, that his idea of a good political party would be one that abolished all federal and state and city taxes. Now, um, he unfortunately forgot to tell us how these communities and the nation were to be supported otherwise, but at the same time, he undoubtedly will gather a number of strong adherents to the, to the concept. Taxation, while it was only a shadow of what we know today, was of concern in the early 19th century. Uh, the individual was beginning uh, to enter into a new economic era. What we call today the average man began to have money in his pocket. Now this would change any system of economy anywhere on earth. The old time of barter and exchange was fading out of our minds. Of course, even in the early half of the 19th century, the average physician was paid in eggs or whatever they happened to have. But uh, gradually, cash was beginning to emerge. This meant, with it, a rising tide of rebellion against such social barriers as had previously divided class groups, both in the United States and England to a lesser degree on the continent, but certainly in these two areas, prominently. The man with money in his pocket suddenly began to realize that he was a potential aristocrat. He also came to the final conclusion uh, that uh, a person who has no money in his pocket is also a potential socialist. And uh, being of this mind and not having anything, was very enthusiastic in dividing it with other people. Uh, we learned one lesson. Those who have wanted to keep. Those who did not have wanted everyone else to share. This led to some intriguing political developments in this period of time. But while, the, as ma while many of them, such as the populist movement and uh, similar groups, did not exactly accomplish their goals or achieve anything in particular, they did leave a heritage of speculation, a heritage uh, which later supported the single tax idea and now apparently is inspiring the no tax idea. Uh, this, uh, this social growth, however, literally meant that human beings were beginning to accumulate things. While they had nothing, there was nothing to tax. But when they began to have things, when land began to be more valuable, when cities began to grow, uh, when produce and, and, and construction procedures were under greater demand, uh, the possibility of raising standards of living and of gradually integrating what we would term today the great middle class, these dreams took uh, visualization and a great deal of form. So in this uh, period also we begin to see the rise of labor organizations, uh, the beginning of man's effort uh, to participate in the profits of production, and of course the great slogan of early socialism, production for use instead of for profit. These things were coming. Uh, all of these procedures uh, increased in many ways the costs and responsibilities of government. And it has been pointed out again and again uh, that the uh, political situation in the United States in the first half of the 19th century uh, was extremely um, a caricature, a kind of cartoon of things that were to come. 
It showed in a small way many problems that we now must face in a much larger and more general manner. Also about the, uh, this time, we began to recognize that in spite of all of our thinking, that the Western Hemisphere was not a really isolated area of land. Uh, gradually, our dependence upon other peoples began to emerge. And while this did not really take much shape until the 20th century, still the rudiments were there. We were beginning to reach out. We were also beginning to travel more. I was reading some letters not long ago, written in 1827, by a young man who had decided to seek fame and fortune by going west. He had left a little town in New Jersey, and he said in his letter, I am going out into the wilderness. I am going west into an unknown land. I am headed for Detroit. <laughs> Now, it's hard for us to realize this situation, but um, that was the way it was. It was a frightful trip in those days. We have several of his letters, including a terrible storm on the Great Lakes and uh, an almost impossible situation in Detroit, including a terrible pestilence that was almost uh, destroying the community. It was a rugged time, but it also gave vent to something that was important. It gave release uh, to the first dangers of over-centralization. Cities and towns were beginning to take definite shape along our Atlantic seaboard. Uh, competition between men was increasing. There was no adequate distribution of goods. Uh, the transportation facilities were so poor that a great many goods could not even be shipped. Therefore, in local areas, life was becoming stifling. And so in this period also, while Peary was sailing the seas and while the English were opening their treaty ports at Amoy and uh, Wuhoo and Wei Hai Wei and several of these choice Chinese names, uh, the American was going west. He was breaking through the Cumberland Gap. He was going further and further into the unknown to hew out a new way of life. Discontent always moved west. Just as previous discontent moving west had left Europe and come to this country. This westward motion, uh, as advocated by Horace Greeley, was factual and, and uh, a tremendous release for steam. People had the sense of adventure still strong within them, and they found it desirable and satisfying to open up new territory and establish themselves in new farms and communities. Thus, what might have become much earlier a social revolution was uh, worked off in migration, in uh, yeah, the adventure of a larger boundary for living. You know, it's interesting that even in this we have a certain parallel with our present problem. We have just about exhausted the possibility of migration. Nearly every uh, square foot of earth that we can do much of anything with is already claimed by somebody. And uh, while the poles may still be available, uh, the um, limitations as yet upon the desirability of the areas is rather discouraging. So what do we do? It looks as though we're heading for other planets. We're looking for other worlds to conquer. It seemingly is part of a psychological pressure within man to break through any limitation that becomes difficult. And the escape from repression, uh, from frustration, pushed the 19th century man west. Here he worked it out or simply fell a victim to the procedure and was not heard of again. <laughs> this situation uh, carried with it a powerful motion of the proletariat group, and the intellectual group was moving in behind, working to solve problems bearing upon these difficulties. Science was beginning to uh, produce the beginnings of relief 
for instance, in the development of transportation. It was not long before the markets of the world were vastly enlarged. Also, in communication, distant places were tied more and more closely together. The development of powerful improvement in utility systems made it possible for larger communities to exist. Uh, the need for feeding the city began to take on practical consideration. And in all of these elements, history stepped in. Because these changes were not made simply by dreamers uh, depending upon their own imagination alone. Each of the steps that was taken by means of which the 19th century emerged from an agricultural or agrarian foundation to an industrial one, each of these steps was based upon a careful consideration of the preceding 5,000 years of history. Without that history, these achievements could not have been possible. Uh, the early planning of American cities from the standpoint of sanitation was based upon the restoration of the patterns and plans set up by v Vitruvius to make possible the metropolitan city of Rome. It was necessary to create vast systems of sewers and aqueducts to supply cities. Our early American communities had no knowledge of this. Europe had very little knowledge of it, except in those areas where the ancient Roman remains still existed. But in a comparatively short time, uh, based upon the old Roman pattern, the city of New York became capable of becoming a great world metropolis. It was back to these old ideas, reformed, reconstructed, and redirected. The same is true in almost every field in which progress was made. In some cases, more ingenuity was presently applied than in others. But in each case, there was some inspiration derived from the common experience of man, the experience of tradition, legendary, and history. In this situation, we also see education moving into a new pattern. Education began to attract more and more people. While uh, the communities were scattered, and while man was almost completely the servant of nature in these respects, education was restricted to a comparatively small group. The average farm boy of 125 years ago had to have his education according to the seasons of the year. The only time he could go to school was in winter when it was very difficult to get there. In almost all other seasons he was an essential part of economy. He had to be present for the harvesting, he had to be present for the sowing, he had to be present for all of the various uh, duties which had to do with survival. And if he was able to secure two or three years of education, it was a great sacrifice to his family as, uh, because of his need in the economy of his time. I know one case of a man who uh, passed on only a few years ago, who in order to reach the school where he went to school, had to swim through three rivers every day. And in uh, the early spring and late fall, when these rivers were partly frozen, it was no easy task. In fact, he looked forward, hopefully, to those months of winter when there were three and four feet of snow on the ground, because those were the only seasons when he didn't have to swim the rivers. This type of thing was scarcely conducive to the rapid expansion of higher education. <laughs> And uh, with the exception of a small group of metropolitan areas, the situation was rather consistent. Schooling itself in those days was also very sketchy. It was difficult, really, to find out what to teach the individual. It wasn't until about the year 1900 that people began to decide what they could be taught. Up to that time, truly, we had the three R's. The child was taught to read and to write, and to add up simple sums. He needed all these in order uh, to survive economically. Certainly, even though he was producing on a farm, he had to know the weights of the things he bought and sold. He had to be able to keep some record of transactions, although in many cases, grown people kept the records only by making nicks in the side of trees. 
In these days, education as a planned program for man's social adjustment with progress was comparatively unknown. His education uh, was largely in order to him that he might live, that he might exist, that he might keep some records of his daily transactions, that he might communicate with his loved ones, should they be at a distance or he be traveling, or that he could read his Bible. These were the concerns which, prompt, which prompted his achievements. Uh, it was not until uh, a little later that education was really formalized. As late as 1850 and 1860, uh, lawyers, doctors, and other professional persons were simply studied by an apprenticeship method and uh, perhaps had a very brief interlude of formal training. All these uh, situations began to reflect upon the life of the people, an expanding economy, uh, a gradually improving level of living, demanded greater intellectual achievement, demanded greater perspective, and greater skill to keep up with the changes that were taking place. So we can say that by, by 1850, there were marked improvements, and the modern theory of education was coming into existence. Uh, this theory of education has constantly expanded since that time. But education also is a form of liberation. Perhaps, as we have previously suggested, one of the greatest of all the liberalizing factors was our increasing uh, orientation in the field of the sciences for the reason that through greater knowledge of biology, chemistry, physics, also the scientific arts, such as anthropology and things of that nature, we were beginning to sense our relationship not only to a larger universe, but to a universe of potentials. We were beginning to realize that around us were great untapped sources of raw material. We began to consider the possibility of chemistry on an industrial level, and uh, we were thinking more and more of illumination even prior to the development of the electric light, the coming of the telephone, and things of that nature. All of these were motions toward liberation. But most of all, they liberated the mind into a kind of mood of expectancy. So one thing we can say in the first half of the 19th century was that it was composed of those years in which human expectancies grew great. Uh, perhaps again in contrast to the first half of the present century in which our expectancies have gradually diminished. Until now, the average person faces the future with great fear. The 19th century man, on the level of education, faced the 19th century with a great hope. He began to see the roots and beginnings of things, many of which had great promise. He was not yet disillusioned, by the fact that everything he devised could be abused. He was still in the devising stage, and he, and he saw many wonderful possibilities, dreams and adventures, as expressed in the writings of Jules Burns and other men of the time who really expressed the fantasy of the 19th century mind. It was a world in which everyone was busy accomplishing something. Each one saw an opportunity to improve himself in some way, perhaps only in his comforts and commodities, but certainly he was working for objectives. Now, labor at this time also began to come into conflict with education. Uh, labor at that time, and uh, we can go back to our statistics because I checked some of these in uh, official re records, a laboring man around the turn of the century, the, around the year 1800 to 1810, usually went to work at five o'clock in the morning and ended what he called an ordinary day at seven o'clock at night. Therefore, a fair working day was about 14 hours. During these 14 hours also, he was not uh, allowed very much leisure. Uh, there were not many coffee breaks in those days. <laughs> Usually, his uh, work was being watched carefully, not by a foreman, 
but by a prudent farmer or someone of that nature who had learned from his cattle and his horses that in order to get the best results you drove them hard. Uh, at that time there was not too much consideration for what it might mean to the individual to have a little rest or a few privileges. At last, there was a tremendous revolution that threatened to rock the foundations of American economy. And by means of this revolution, the working day was shortened to the hideously restricted period of 12 hours. No one believed that the nation would survive the shock. One man got up and said, in that length of time, nothing worthwhile can be done. Uh, the struggle also to determine whether the other two hours should be paid for that were no longer being used took 50 years to settle. <laughs> but with that kind of work, and it was a six-day week, the individual had only one day of the week left. He had very little uh, uh, method of illumination in his home, therefore, with a few exceptions, he did no evening reading or anything of that kind. He was too tired, and his uh, way of life did not provide adequate facilities or inducements. Even with a 12-hour day, he was rather busy, because in that same uh, period, the seventh day was also a rather arduous day. Uh, a good family in good orthodox standing started its religious observances on Sunday morning by early prayer at anywhere from 5.30 to 6 a.m. Uh, from about 8 o'clock in the morning to 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon was devoted entirely to religious services. And the really devout went back and had a further treatment in the evening. In order to get to your place of worship, you might have to drive two or three hours in a dashboard buggy. So Sunday was not exactly a day all to yourself. Somewhere in this pattern also, the devout woman, who of course had to go to church and full, fulfill all the services, and on this day was expected to bring the hired people in also, the maids or the gardeners or the hired men, whatever it might be, they all had the right to go to church and to put on their best suits and to fix up their boots with goose grease and be at their very best. After this was all over, sometime during the day, the good woman of the house might be expected to prepare a Sunday dinner for anywhere from 12 to 40 people. So it was not what might be termed a quiet Sabbath. <laughs> Under these conditions, it was evident that the intellectual life of the people was not inclined to flourish. It was necessary to begin to restrict hours of labor in order to release men for the privileges of study. Around 1810, one of the first of these moves was made in an attack upon the employment of small children in labor. In other words, a move was taken, particularly in the uh, urban areas, the towns and communities, to make it required that children would have some opportunity for schooling. Originally, the minimum guarantee was two years. Gradually, this was increased, and there was a greater psychological emphasis against using child labor. But it was not until past the middle of the century that these reforms really took uh, on complete proportions. But it was at this time that it began to be fashionable for children to have a chance to go to school. Of course, this fashion was not uh, able to reach the suburban areas for some time later, because on the farm the child was valued merely as a contribution to the general survival. Thus we had a beginning of a fight for education, which meant at that time that only a minute fraction of our population could hope to have what we would term a college education. But the, the battle of the mind over the economic necessity continued. And about before the, before the year of 1850, we begin to see another trend showing up in employment, and that is the beginning of selectivity in favor of the educated person. And this, of course, immediately changed the whole picture. As soon as education meant income, means to attain it took on a great deal more character. 
The first half of the century was also devoted in, to a measure in the experiment of wealth. And this experiment, wealth now, assumed as a means of liberation. This experiment was undertaken with more naivete than we can hardly appreciate. Uh, it was almost completely sugar-coated in idealistic indoctrination. Uh, wealth was always regarded at that time as the indication of superior virtue. The wealthy individual was the one who worked hard, long hours, and kept all of the formulas of an Horatio Alger hero. By luck and pluck, uh, by vim and vigor, he rose above mediocrity. There was never a suggestion in any of this uh, collection of uh, penny wonderfuls that there were any conspiracies possible in finance. Uh, always merit won, always demerit was punished. So that we ended upon or trusted our weight to the rather uncertain ground of high finance with a tremendous amount of optimistic integrity. We were quite convinced that wealth in the new way of things under our modern way of life was going to be the reward for virtue and that only the virtuous could possibly become rich. I might add that there's been some disillusionment in this direction since. <laughs> we are not quite as secure in our feelings on the matter. But as we do all things in the same way, we attack wealth with the firm belief that it was going to prove to be the greatest emancipating force. Wealth was going to enable us to buy intelligence. It was going to enable us to spend money for self-improvement. When this wealth began to accumulate, we didn't always use it that way, but that was the idea. So in the first half of the 19th century, liberation from medi mediocrity through the possibility of private wealth and private industry began to take powerful force. It was then that we began our pattern of rugged individualism that ended in 1929 in ragged individualism. It was a long and disillusioning period in which we struggled to prove that by means of wealth we could be happy, we could be secure, and we could attain peace. At that, and during that period, anything that seemed to endanger this situation, particularly from the outside, was simply rejected, cast aside, and, and considered no part of a world which was completely surrounded by the invisible wall of the Monroe Doctrine. This situation uh, goes on into other brackets, and I think that uh, out of the various ones, we're going to have to pause somewhere. We can't cover them all, because we have some other things to do, but we will mention only that the rising of economics the rising tide of transportation and communication opening the world, uh, industrial and trade alliances with other nations, and the development of science, particularly first in England and Germany and later in the United States, meant that the 19th century separated itself from all preceding time. And we began to see the emerging of the organized human society that we recognize today a society heavily dependent upon the provisions of science, a society uh, made as secure as it is by the tremendous advancement which we have made, particularly in scientific industrialism. Now in this period, of course, we had this conviction that everything that we were doing was do being done for the good of man. Man was taking under humanism, which had been developing in the 18th century, a very large place in the pattern. The 18th century humanists, like Rousseau, or Montesquieu, or even Voltaire, had stated clearly that man is king of his world, that in this material world man can do anything that he can do that there is no limitation upon him except the limitation which he places upon himself. That anything that he can capture in nature he has a right to. 
and this gradually developed into a rather rugged attitude that nature existed only to be exploited by man. Natural resources, everything, were available for man to use as he pleased. And scientific progress was teaching him how to use these things according to a code which was becoming intensively materialistic. As the proprietor of the universe, man gained a swelled head. He began to regard himself as a being with limitless opportunity and no responsibility. In his scientific researches, he had not been enough of a historian to realize that other people in other ways had tried this before him and had come to grief. He did not recognize the moral and ethical responsibilities of increasing temporal ability and authority. This tragedy was pointed out over a hundred years ago, but men were too busy succeeding at that time to pay much attention to it. They could not conceive uh, that their own individual rights should be subjected voluntarily to a pattern of ethics. So the 19th century from the beginning of end to end shows a rising tide of rights and a slowly lowering level of ethics. This meant that by the end of the 19th century, liberated man had fallen almost completely into the slough of materialism. He had achieved a vast amount of skill. He was gradually solving the problems of sanitation and of housing and of ventilation. He was beginning to attack very boldly the matter of income and private wealth and private ownership. And yet with all these things, he was not achieving his primary end, security. This security was still eluding him. He was liberated from everything except his own ignorance. He had a new kind of knowledge, but this knowledge was not a panacea for a grand ignorance. Thus, as his intelligence became more and more specialized, and, and the area of it was increasingly restricted by his interests, he began to lose sight completely of his true relationship to the universe of which he was a part. The universe became less important to him. Ancient man stood in awe of everything. Modern man stood in awe only of his own achievements. Ancient man feared the universe. Modern man, as a result of 25 or 30 centuries of evolution, uh, came to that more exalted condition in which he feared himself and other human beings. The dinner saw was gone, but man was still afraid because he was gradually losing confidence in man. Liberation was liberating characteristics and qualities within human nature which religion had frustrated and which circumstances had denied. The loosening of religion and the broadening of circumstances therefore caused man to exhibit out of himself tendencies uh, which had been long frustrated and which became more violent because of this frustration. It was therefore well before the end of the century that those who were really thoughtful began to see the handwriting on the wall. They began to recognize that we had to have a new definition for liberty, a new definition for the right of the individual in relation to the common good of all men. History records this procedure with great accuracy and brings us down to the second century of this era uh, with a great many facts available. Now history, unfortunately, like all other forms of learning, is useful only to those who will examine it. And as our own thinking changes, we must realize that histories are written under the pressures of prevailing concepts. Little by little, therefore, the historical works of our generation have lost their moral integration. 
History now is regarded as a statement of bare facts. History is limited largely today to the competitive recounting of the scientific achievements of the last century. History as a record of the basic state of man is almost totally ignored. History as a record of mistakes is conveniently forgotten. Yet the histories do exist and they are available to the individual who is willing to question the success of that which is obviously very shaky. If, however, we depend upon popular historians and depend upon histories which have been watered down for the consumption of our young people, we shall realize that the great issues of history are carefully avoided. These issues include the man's 20th century relationship to the consequences of his 19th century conduct. Also, the record of man continuing persistently to perpetuate mistakes. Individual, because of his hyper-individualistic attitude today, has followed in an ancient false formula. He has assumed that because he is an individual, he is an exception to the rules governing all other individuals. History points out that it cannot find one of these exceptions. But man is not interested in that phase. When he studies the lives of great dictators, he conveniently glosses over their ultimate disasters. He reads that part of history which seems to support him, and ignores that which demonstrates that he is wrong. Thus, 20th century history is very largely today a record of 19th century and early 20th century achievement. It reads like a fairy tale. It is just more wonderful than words can find, and certainly should cause every young person to be blissfully ignorant of the truth. Namely, that many of these historical episodes or historical circumstances have been utterly interpreted away from the fact. The truth of the matter as it is today is that all history, from ancient times and far places down to the present time, has demonstrated clearly that no civilization can survive the decadence of its culture. That civilizations are not overthrown by their enemies on the outside, but by the decline of their own ethical standard on the inside that we are not captured by barbarians, but are enslaved by the perpetual barbarian within ourselves. Thus all history tells us that unless we pause and take some advantage of the lesson of history, that we are headed for trouble. Now in this emergency, many things could theoretically be done. History could become a valuable key to assisting us in restoring a balance of values. No one wants us to go back to a 14-hour day, nor a 12-pound-a-year salary. No one expects us to give up all the conveniences and commodities with which we have become accustomed. But history does warn us that moderation alone contributes to survival and that all excess destroys. This is as factual as though it was demonstrated in a laboratory. And it has been demonstrated in some levels in a laboratory. The, re the inevitable conclusion must be that a people under a fanaticism or under a pressure, an ideological uh, dynamic, will have a tendency to ignore the greater part of its own cultural need to the overdevelopment of a particular. Unbalance has always been the cause of historical decline as we have it from the beginning of time. Compromise is another. From the time that the Romans attempted to compromise with the Huns, we have never had an example of a successful compromise in history, especially on a level of nations.
We have also learned that wherever in history uh, the economic, political power of a people surpasses in its growth, in its rate of growth, uh, the cultural, ethical, moral growth of a people, that that people will inevitably pervert knowledge. Therefore, that an individual who knows more than his conduct can sustain in a manner of integrity is a menace. We are full into this problem. Now we have finally uh, accomplished liberation from ignorance. So that today, ignorance in the classical meaning of the term is uh, comparatively extinct in our way of life and is rapidly disappearing in the outlying areas around our culture. On the other hand, we have not achieved a liberation from knowledge. And that seems to be our next challenge. First, we were enslaved by what we did not know. And we have at least 3,500 years of history to prove that. Now, we are becoming enslaved by what we do know. So that instead of the man being the master, now knowledge is the master. And knowledge is moving man to the fulfillment of its own blind purposes. Man has given up serving other men, but he is now serving the thoughts of specialists. As a result of this kind of slavery, the individual as an individual is rapidly disappearing. And in his place, dominion is in the hands of policy. It is assumed that man must act according to the progress of his sciences, must adjust himself to the motions of his industries, and must accept whatever directive his economy imposes upon him. In other words, his achievements have become too big for him. And in the presence of this utter inconsistency, we must also come to the realization that science, industry, and economics are not beings. They are not rational creatures. They are not moral structures. They are simply techniques. They are methods. They are means for accomplishing certain purposes. And within the structure of each means is only the directive to its own ends. Therefore, anything lying beyond the original ends will not be considered by the means by which those ends are attained. In this way, we have placed ourselves under the complete dominion of an amoral force, a force which could not teach us anything on an ethical level because it is not a rational creature capable of devising an ethical code. Now, we like to assume that instead of ethics, we are now substituting policy based upon inevitable processes of universal law. We like to assume that science is revealing to us a lawful universe. We like to assume also that through trial and error and experimentation, we have gradually come into adjustment with the peculiar laws governing economics and industry. We have very little to prove that we have accomplished this, because nearly every day we are under the severe pressure of reverses which should not occur in a lawful structure. In substance, then, the ancient man was in slavery to a class of aristocrats. Modern man is in slavery to a group of ideas. These ideas are not bad, any more than an automobile is bad. But an automobile is a deadly weapon in the hands of a psychologically imbalanced person. It is also a deadly weapon in the hands of an ethically immature person. There is nothing wrong with the automobile. The trouble lies in the lack of responsibility and integrity understanding or skill 
of the driver or in the case of a so-called unavoidable accident perhaps of the uh, construction of the vehicle itself actually however in our modern way of life we need history history comes to us in the form of a kind of religion history tells us beyond any doubt that the essential theme of the ancient fairy tale is more true than the products of the modern laboratory for it was the, uh, the essence of the ancient fable that good must triumph it was the essence of the ancient legend that with many adversities and reverses and great hazards and dangers the hero must be true to his principles and must finally demonstrate his own integrity thus establishing himself as a true hero as a superior person entitled to live happily ever after our present policy is not assuring us of any of these things thus we come into the second century of our great cycle beginning in the year 1900 inheriting a series of mistakes which have never been corrected and inheriting also a new vista of time because one thing that we haven't pointed out as yet in relation to the philosophy of history is that history is related to time and time in its largest dimension as far as our moral life is concerned is opportunity time for us today is future time is an allotment between the sowing and reaping during which it is our privilege and duty to act properly in the gardening of our crop if we do not use the interval between cause and effect with a certain moral definition the effect is going to be correspondingly deformed thus time is available to us to make history out of the consideration of the past man could evolve a complete historical theology history can convince him on the level of fact of practically every element of ancient religion history can prove to him the Ten Commandments of the Mosaic Code with greater certainty than any moralist can define them history can prove conclusively the integrity of the Sermon on the Mount yet at the same time at any moment in history men may violently deny these ethical principles and presumably demonstrate they can survive without them but history again is a measure of survival history is not something which merely extends around the immediate moment history is that condition or that motion in time by which all things finally leave their immediate significance to gradually increase in perspective until they become world values thus I think we should take into consideration that this era of liberation which must go on for the best part of 450 years into the future represents as we see it today certainly at this period in its development the desperate need to untangle uh, the heritage which we received we have become like a group of children who have inherited a parental estate and are now squabbling over it we do not want to be like those children who also squander the estate for we know today in the majority of cases children will squander their inheritances to squander the inheritance of history is to bankrupt a civilization it is to destroy its relationship to the laws which govern the socialized motion of species and groups thus in the future man must continually liberate himself 
and we can turn to some of the philosophical episodes marked in history to determine how this can be done. And wherever it has successfully been assailed and has achieved at least a temporary victory, this has always resulted from the individual gradually gaining a moderate attitude toward the situations in which he finds himself. The motion away from extreme. Now let us take an example of an extreme as we know it today. We are concerned constantly over the increased cost of living. We are threatened that in many fields of activity it will probably rise 1% a month for some time yet. It is quite possible that this rise will be blocked by the early introduction of effects from some of the immediately preceding causes, and this may be blocked to some degree, but we are concerned very seriously with it at the moment. Yet on every hand we find that the individual declines to moderate his own demands upon life. He is constantly seeking more with which to meet the rising costs of life. This can go on to a most exaggerated state, or it can result in the complete collapse of what might otherwise be a very useful economic theory. It rests again with the individual, or with the group of individuals, who must regain control over the policies which they themselves have established. These policies cannot be permitted to run headlong, or to act like a horse that, had used, that once escaped and ran away. It, these uh, commodities, these policies, these processes, these patterns must finally be moderated. They must be brought within the pattern of the reasonable or they cannot survive. And in our busy day with our tremendous emphasis upon achievement, we have forgotten the science of reason. And being deprived of the science of reason, we do not know how to be reasonable. I talked to a man about it not long ago, and he said, well, that's all right. I guess you're supposed to be reasonable. Perhaps it would help. But he said, I've got a private philosophy of my own, which seems to be working for me. And that is, instead of being reasonable, take all you can get while you can get it. The same man is wailing on the fact that he can't keep anything that he's getting. So the situation is not as optimistic as even he would like to assume. Contemplation upon history produces the philosopher historian. It makes the individual realize that from history can be derived the working solution to practically any problem that we face today. We say to each other, sometimes to ourselves, we do not know the answer. Yet there is no principle with which we are concerned today which has not previously been applied in some way. And the operations of that principle can be studied and estimated with almost infallible accuracy. What we hope is that these principles will not be consistent. We hope that we can prove ourselves an exception to the rule of life. This is going to be a little difficult. And we are more optimistic than, uh, than stable in our attitude. Actually, from the philosophy of history, we can find the working formulas for things that we want today. We know how crime can be solved. We know how juvenile delinquency can be solved. We know how religious intolerance and racial intolerance can be solved. We also know how the danger of depression can be removed. We know how peace can be achieved. We know how uh, the individual's personal security can be advanced. We know how health can be improved. We know how old age can be retarded. We know all of these things. But we do not wish to face the implications of them. So we prefer to drift 
hoping for the best and with a very profound internal conviction that the best is not going to occur. As a proof, more or less, of this uncertainty, we can note the tremendous revival of religious interest in the United States and in other countries. Men are becoming a little frightened, and in their fear they are on the verge of restoring a few phases of the divine initiative. When man can't run the universe, he gives it back to God. While he can run it, he denies God any part in it. Actually, there are not these unsolvable mysteries. There are simply patterns that are factual. Patterns, however, which cannot be applied unless there are major changes in our policies of living. The individual cannot remain the same and get better. In order to achieve practically every end that we conceive to be valuable, we must liberate ourselves from the fixation of our present infallibility. We have got to face a number of facts and we've got to dignify reason, restore the rational power of man. We have got to recognize that the greatest asset that humanity possesses is the creative rationality of the enlightened human being. Without this asset, all else fails. And all systems which so regiment men that this creative contribution is denied, frustrated, or lost, will pay for this regimentation with our own existence. These facts we know simply from history. Therefore, we cannot say that it is a dull, dry subject, nor can we say that it has no place in religion or no place in philosophy, that it belongs to the moldy systems of ancient culture. It does not. It is a constant living value. It is a mirror into which we constantly must look to see the reflection of our own way of doing things. History of the 20th century is a shocking example of the results of an excessive 19th century departure from ethics. Without what happened in the 19th century, the 20th century would not have followed. And if the 20th century does not solve some of these problems, it will again sow a whirlwind and reap a whirlwind. If then, in history, we have the result of collective action, let us also realize that the historical entity, considered as a total, is also a kind of abstract personality. That which the total historical entity has found to be unreasonable, will never be reasonable in the conduct of an individual. That which has failed for a thousand uh, different dictators will never succeed for another dictator, but he is always hoping that it will. That which may be a billion or two billion human beings have found to be untrue we will not prove to be true. I do not mean in opinion, I mean in practice. I mean in the experience of how to live and what the consequences will be. Man has struggled through a great many levels of primitive life, but he has achieved and survived because of certain values, and his survival has never flowered into its proper maturity because of the absence of certain other values. As long as values remain as they are, some present and other important ones absent, our civilizations will continue to be inconclusive. We will never achieve the final consummation that we desire. Out of this fact also comes a recognition that a human family is not different from a family of nations, that the beliefs of whole generations of persons have produced effects very similar to those effects that will occur to us if we as persons hold the same beliefs. Thus history is forever a generalization upon a particular. And history is always capable of bestowing 
this generalization upon a particular, assisting that particular, a person, in his own orientation. If, therefore, we go back over these periods, we will find that the intolerances and intemperances of history are merely mass examples of the intolerances and intemperances of individuals. What happened to the nation or the race because of a certain intemperance or intolerance will, une will inevitably occur to an individual who follows the same procedure. Thus history becomes a personal guide as well as a collective guide. Recognizing as the tradition of the Phoenix tells us that this is the great era of liberation. Man's duty is to liberate himself from anything and everything that prevents him from being a balanced, mature human being. He must liberate himself from childishness, from his own adolescence. He must uh, liberate himself from false, glamorous hopes. He must liberate himself from inanity, stupidity, and a kind of learned ignorance in which he knows much, but nothing that he knows helps him to live better. He must liberate himself from the great collective policies which now tell him that this and that are acceptable, fashionable, and necessary. He must do these things to what degree he can in his personal life, and to the degree he succeeds, he improves his personal life. He must also face the fact that by collective action, he must ultimately achieve these things collectively in order that nations may have security and freedom from the national diseases of poverty, war, and unemployment. These problems are all scientifically understandable and demonstrable. And the purpose of science is to discover the whole truth. And that whole truth is that the world of knowledge is suspended from a world of good laws. And that the universe of scientific achievement is meaningless unless it is governed by ethical attainment. These patterns uh, may astonish us, may disturb us, may worry us. But we must ultimately face them historically. Namely, that these things must be done. And until they are done, there will be no change in our patterns of security and insecurity. Consequently, a philosophy of history, which makes the whole subject worthwhile, brings us into kinship with the ancient world, shows us how we are really reaching our hands across time to clasp the hands of heroes who have shown us good ways before that our understanding is, in a sense, completely beyond chronological limitation. In the urgent need of mankind, it is not nearness or remoteness of time, but essential value of quality that is important. In order to win our final fight, we must learn from all that knew more than we do, and we must teach all that know less. And until these ends are attained, History will be a record of trial and error, of some success and many failures. But we can improve it, and we can gain from it, and we can grow through the contemplation of it into a better way of life for ourselves. And now our time is up, so next week we will begin a new series of studies in which we are going to take...